we think it's uh, still very important for key uh, figures in the regime to uh, achieve the peaceful transfer of power uh, from the Maduro clique to interim president Juan Guaido. That was the former U.S. National Security Advisor and now current Republican presidential candidate John Bolton speaking four years ago from the White House in the midst of demonstrations and an attempted uprising by the opposition in Venezuela, backed, of course, by Washington. Juan Guaido is uh, out on the streets of Caracas now. He's rallying the people. He's called for the people to come out, and they are. They are increasingly on the streets. As I think many of you know, there were mass demonstrations planned for tomorrow. Uh, The circumstances of uh, what's happened today uh, in Caracas have called people out all over the country. Uh, So uh, Guaido is behaving in the same courageous way he and other figures in the opposition have these last three months. Fast forward four years, Juan Guaido has arrived in Miami, and it may well end up being his permanent home. The man who was essentially appointed by Bolton and the Trump administration as the president of Venezuela, much to the astonishment of the rest of the world, including the Venezuelan people and the country's elected president, Nicolas Maduro, is now a refugee in the United States. The opposition leader landed at dawn Tuesday, saying he was thrown out of Colombia when that country's president, Gustavo Petro, hosting an international summit on Venezuela, deported him to the United States. To discuss this and more, we're joined by two journalists from the region, Stephen Sefton, who spoke with us from Esteli, Nicaragua, and Camila Escalante, who spoke with us from Sao Paulo, Brazil. Okay, Stephen and Camilla, I'm sorry, uh, I couldn't resist. Let's start with this uh, summit in Colombia that had the high point of uh, liberating the people of Venezuela from a bad joke. Well, precisely. So Petro had a bright idea. Of course, Petro, you know, is trying to position himself as some sort of leader in the region. And he, from the very beginning of his administration, decided to reopen, reestablish diplomatic relations, political relations with neighboring Bolivar in Venezuela. And that, of course, was a good thing. They've reopened several of the land borders there uh, and the, you know, the west side of Venezuela uh, with uh, Colombia, including the Cucuta Bridge. This is extremely important. But now he decided to uh, promote this summit in Bogota, which would include 20 countries, um, among them representation, which were ambassadors, other representatives from different countries, including the EU's Joseph Burrell. So a number of, of, of parties there participated in this meeting yesterday in Bogota. And if you look at the list of this 20 countries, it's a lot of countries that are not friendly with Venezuela. In fact, a lot of them uh, took the side of Washington when Juan Guaido swore himself in as some sort of leader of the country. And so it's very bizarre what's taken place. Um, It's bizarre that Petro would kind of have this dialogue because, of course, what they're trying to do is talk about the political situation in Venezuela. And they say that they want to bring Venezuela, the government, uh, led by President Nicolas Maduro, of course, and the Chavistas, back to the table to have dialogue with this far-right sector of the opposition. But the fact is that the government, as stated by President Nicolas Maduro, as stated by the President of the National Assembly, uh, Jorge Rodriguez, have said that they have very specific demands if they're going to resume dialogue with the sector of the opposition. And those demands are first and foremost the lifting completely of all unilateral course of measures, all sanctions illegally imposed on Venezuela, and also the freedom, the the liberation of political prisoner in the United States, Alex Saab. And so these are some of the things that they're asking for right now in order to sit down with uh, with this sector of the opposition. But there's absolutely no reason, um, in my view, and I think from the view of anyone who is anti-imperialist and hence has seen what damage the international community, quote unquote, has done to Venezuela by trying to intervene and really trying to to mediate. I'm not sure that this is helpful. I'm not sure that the average Venezuelans see what's going on in Bogota as helpful, uh, but they held it nevertheless. 
come negotiate with us while we have a gun to your head. And they're saying, that's not negotiating, and we're not doing that, basically. And, and of course, they don't need to because the government does, in fact, enjoy wide support in Venezuela, or more so than it did at the last election, as a matter of fact. Yeah, and lots of support from the international community. Um, you know, remember that a lot of these countries that may be broke diplomatic relations at some period or had uneasy relations such as the so-called Lima Group, they've actually resumed relations and they have their ambassadors back in Caracas now. They've exchanged ambassadors and they're resuming trade and everything else. So Venezuela was in no way isolated previously and it's even less so now. It has enjoys very good relations with all of these countries. So, you know, they really don't really have a lot to uh to to try to blacklist the government with and i think you know nicolas maduro is looking forward to the elections where he's going to be running again as president it seems yeah and one of the things to bear in mind is that the results of this um, summit that was organized by gustavo petro were very much along uh, classical um center-right social democrat lines talking about the need for free and fair elections and so on and they they in in effect they set out although they didn't frame it as conditions, they set out kind of what they uh, propose as a series of uh, what they regard as reasonable requirements with which the Venezuelan government should comply in order for its demands, as Camilla has just pointed out, principally the lifting of all sanctions, both by the United States and the European Union. Um, they, and and the, that, that explains probably why the Venezuelan government's response has been somewhat muted. I mean, they've just, they've just been very polite, um, saying that they, uh, and this is a quote, take note, end quote, of the um, declaration that finished the conference that was organized by um, Gustavo Petro in Colombia with, with all those countries, the most important of which from Venezuela's point of view probably is Mexico which is uh, the country that was the site of the previous round of negotiations with Venezuela's right-wing opposition. And the other thing that uh, was interesting in relation to this conference, um, Don and Camila, as you, you, you both commented before we began our conversation, is that um, Juan Guaido tried to uh, break into the the conference, as it were. He had to almost tried to gate crash the conference, <laughs> crossing crossing the border illegally from Venezuela into Colombia. And he could perfectly well have been locked up for that by Gustavo Petro That's and the right. Colombian authorities. Yep. But uh, Petro and the Colombian authorities treated him with kid gloves um, and allowed him to get on a plane to. Um, to Miami, as I understand it, but the the the, the one of the interesting things about that is that um, whereas much of uh, the international news coverage of that incident spoke of Guaido being expelled from Colombia, in fact, Gustavo Petro and his government spokespeople said that he wasn't expelled; he was just asked to get on the plane. Finally, uh, just in terms of the new role that Colombia is playing in the region. Um, I mean, this is clearly a, a shift, you know, given the uh, re results of the last election in terms of the direction of uh, Colombia's government. Do you see uh, an increased role going forward for Colombia or, or, or in any event, more of, of their uh, playing sort of regional actor? Every single day is a test for Colombia. I think we need to be watching very closely at what the role is of Gustavo Petro and his government. Right now, yesterday, he asked for the resignation of his of his cabinet ministers. And so there's a lot going on in Colombia. Internally, they have a lot of issues. They haven't even begun to deal with any of the issues they have in terms of uh, the violence on the countryside in terms of the paramilitaries and the drug cartels, which still exist, there's still vast DEA presence. And of course, the U.S. military bases in Colombia. It's an occupied territory in the Americas. It is literally a U.S. doormat country. And Colombia's government needs to deal with that. They can't be sitting around trying to pretend to be mediators or leaders on anything, certainly not human rights. It is literally the most backwards country in terms of human rights, where people suffer for being uh, afro 
uh, Afro-Colombian, for being indigenous, and for being working class. So there's a lot of issues yeah. internally. Colombia is not in a position right now to be any sort of leader. I don't think ideologically Petro is the right person to lead this region. And so I think that they really need to look internally, deal with their problems, and leave the leadership for other countries such as Nicaragua or Venezuela itself, which are really, you know, putting forth some very important proposals, both in terms of for what they're developing in their countries and externally for, you know, what they're proposing for a multipolar world. Yeah, for the moment, I think um, Gustavo Petro is going to project himself as a champion of social democracy in the region. And he'll call, he'll paint that, he'll depict that as being progressive, when in fact, as Camila says, he's very much a, 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 a under the thumb of the United States. And one of the, among the foreign policy issues, along with all the domestic issues that Camilla mentioned, is the very thorny issue of what, how he's going to manage his relations with the People's Republic of China. Mm. Yeah, and which is a very key one in this region. Okay, well, uh, the clock is our master today. We're out of time and appreciate your time. And I uh, would like to further develop these issues as we've been doing uh, sometime next week. And thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for inviting Thank me. Thank you, Don. For KPFK, I'm Don DeBar.